the deck of a German warship, the crew rolled trolleys loaded with huge metal spheres towards the stern. It was nearly midnight on the 21st of June 1941, the eve of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. And German warships were busy mining the Gulf of Finland. There were just a few hours left before the first German air raids hit the Soviet Union and the German ambassador in Moscow handed over a declaration of war. But here in the Baltic, the war had already begun. Unlike the Army and Air Force, the Soviet Navy was expecting war. For three days, it had been on high alert. Its ships and aircraft mounted regular patrols to give early warning of any incoming attack. Just before midnight on the 21st of June, the Navy was put on red alert by its commander, People's Commissar Nikolai Kuznetsov. But while Soviet airfields were hammered on the first day of the war, the Navy was hardly in the firing line at all. The main Baltic naval base at Tallinn wasn't even attacked. But naval mobilization still left plenty to be desired. Submarine commander Peter Grishenko was asleep when the Germans attacked. Grishenko, listen. Listen. But it was not the submarine base that was being attacked. It was the airfield. If the bombers had targeted the Soviet fleet, there was every chance they could have pulled off a German Pearl Harbor. But the Germans planned instead to blockade Soviet ships in their ports with mines. The Soviet Navy was divided between four distinct operational zones, the Baltic Sea and Black Sea, the Arctic and the Far East. The distances involved were vast, it was a sea voyage of nearly 9,000 miles from Vladivostok to Leningrad. In 1941, the Soviet Navy possessed few large modern warships. Its expansion had focused instead on submarines and light ships, a strategy advocated by several young Soviet naval theorists. The argument ran one submarine can disable a battleship. Several submarines can impede the actions of several fleets. The doctrine received official approval. People's Commissar of Defense, Clement Voroshilov, declared, All we want is to protect our coasts and borders. Our light forces, naval aviation, and submarines will cripple an attacking enemy. The USSR began a massive program of submarine construction. The Navy conducted maneuvers in which submarines practiced working with coastal batteries, aircraft, and light ships to repel an enemy naval attack. At the outbreak of war, the Soviet Navy had three battleships, seven light cruisers, 54 destroyers, 215 submarines, 22 guardships, 290 torpedo boats, and 62 subhunters. All three battleships dated back to the days of the Tsar. The Baltic fleet was strongest, with two battleships, two modern light cruisers, and 21 destroyers. The Northern Fleet was weakest, with just eight destroyers. The German Navy, in contrast, had three battleships, eight cruisers, 34 destroyers, 
and 155 submarines. At 6.30 a.m. on the 22nd of June, Baltic Fleet Headquarters received orders from People's Commissar Kuznetsov. But such a course could have little effect, as Admiral Pantiliev pointed out. The Nazi Navy had no intention of entering the Gulf of Finland. On the contrary, it intended to blockade us inside it. A cruiser, covered by a smokescreen, maneuvered slowly through the harbor of Tallinn. Every few minutes, its main guns roared out. The cruiser Kirov was firing at German troops advancing on the Estonian capital. The enemy retaliated with heavy artillery. This was why the Kirov kept on the move, hiding amongst the smoke. By late August 1941, the Red Army had been forced to yield most of its Baltic conquests. Only Tallinn remained, a last Soviet bastion in Estonia. The Germans and their Finnish allies were determined to prevent the evacuation of Tallinn by sea. There were only two navigable channels to the city, one along the coast and one through the middle of the Gulf of Finland. The Germans and Finns filled this central channel with two and a half thousand mines. The sea mine was a highly effective naval weapon, responsible for one-fifth of all shipping losses during the war. The German EM, or moored contact mine, consisted of a hollow sphere with seven thin horns. Inside, in a watertight box, was a 300 kilogram explosive charge. Most of the sphere was empty, so the mine would float. The mine was rolled overboard with its trolley, to which it was attached by a cable. The trolley acted as the mine's anchor and held it in place. The cable length could be adjusted to set the depth of the mine. The metal horns triggered the mine. When a ship hit one, it broke an acid container within the horn. This turned it into a battery and sent an electric charge to the detonator. The mine would then explode. Having fought their way to the coast, the Germans opened fire on the navigation channel. Nebel. Man sieht nichts. Worauf sollen wir schießen? But neither artillery nor the mines could prevent Soviet transports reaching Tallinn. Soviet mine hunters led the way. Because of their shallow draft, they passed safely over the mines, dragging a trawl that cut their cables. When a mine floated to the surface, it was destroyed with gunfire, creating safe lanes through the minefield. During August, a steady stream of wounded Soviet soldiers and refugees were evacuated from Tallinn by sea. But it took a heavy toll on the Soviet mine hunters. Some hit shallow mines. Others were sunk by TMA influence mines, triggered by a ship's magnetic field. On the 26th of August, Stalin telegrammed Voroshilov, authorizing a withdrawal from Tallinn and the evacuation of its garrison by sea. The operation called for an armada of more than 200 Soviet ships. They would have to run a gauntlet of German and Finnish aircraft and torpedo boats, and minefields that could not be cleared because of bad weather. The convoy departed Tallinn at noon on the 28th of August, carrying 28,000 soldiers and refugees. The ships sailed in the central channel, meaning German and Finnish coastal batteries fired at extreme range. Luftwaffe dive bombers joined the attack, 
as Soviet destroyers laid smoke screens to protect the convoy. There were dozens of mines in the channel. They soon began to claim their victims. The cruisers and destroyers forged ahead, making for the heavily defended naval base at Kronstadt. The slower transports were left behind. German aircraft fell upon them like vultures. Of the 75 transports that left Tallinn, 12 were destroyed by mines and 19 by aircraft. If the warships had slowed down to protect the convoy, the losses might have been fewer. But the fleet commander needed his warships back safely. The Baltic fleet could not be sacrificed. The cruiser Kirov reached Kronstadt without serious damage, as did 11 of 13 submarines, but only five out of 10 destroyers. Of the 28,000 evacuees, two thirds arrived safely. But more than 15,000 lives had been lost on the 200 mile voyage from Tallinn. Within days, the Germans began their assault on Leningrad. The warships, saved by the brutal decision to abandon the Tallinn convoy, would play a vital part in the city's defense. Hitler's hopes of a rapid victory against the Soviet Union had been dashed. As the war entered its second year, the Germans became increasingly concerned about their own shipping routes. Vital supplies of Swedish iron ore came across the Baltic and along the Norwegian coast. Chrome ore came across the Black Sea from neutral Turkey. The Germans turned to their sophisticated sea mines to protect all these shipping lanes. In 1942, they created huge minefields along Norway's northern coast, watched over by aircraft and coastal batteries. It had an immediate and deadly impact on Soviet submarine patrols. In April 1942, the Schur 421 hit a German mine and sank. The same month, Schur 401 went missing on patrol. Three further submarines were lost in quick succession. Sinkings by Soviet Northern Fleet submarines dropped off rapidly from 21 in the first half of 1942 to just four in the second half of the year. They came at a cost of nine submarines. The sailors of the Baltic Fleet suffered all the hardships of their home base, the besieged city of Leningrad. Rations were so meager that many of them suffered the effects of malnutrition. Meanwhile, German factories were turning Swedish iron ore into tanks, guns and shells. Only the submarines of the Baltic fleet could disrupt this supply. On the 2nd of July, 1942, S-7 under Commander Leeson, slipped through the minefields of the Gulf of Finland. Sweden was neutral, but while surfaced, Leeson came under attack from Swedish aircraft and was lucky to escape. That night, Leeson sank the Swedish transport Margareta, loaded with coal. Two days later, he sank another Swedish ship, Lulio, carrying iron ore to Germany. The Swedes claimed both ships had been sunk within territorial waters, a violation of their neutrality. The Soviets denied this, but felt it prudent to order S-7 away from the Swedish coast. 
On the 30th of July, Leeson sighted four more ships. To overtake them, he took a huge risk, sailing on the surface at full speed in broad daylight. He attacked from a depth of just 20 feet. If detected, he stood little chance of escape. But Leeson's audacity paid off. The German transport cutter was sunk. S7 had no torpedoes left and was heading home when a Finnish steamer was detected. The main deck gun had jammed, so the crew opened fire with their anti-aircraft gun. It took almost 400 shells to sink her. From the wreckage, Leeson picked up the Finnish captain and his engineer and brought them to Leningrad. It was a very rare example of a submarine taking prisoners. Four crew members of the S-7 were decorated. Leeson was recommended for the highest award, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. In September 1942, S-12 under Commander Turiev left on patrol. But one day in, she was damaged in an attack by Finnish aircraft. Her leaking oil tanks left a greasy trail on the water's surface. Then, the sonar operator picked up the sound of propellers. The submarine's batteries were almost dead, and she was in shallow water. On the charts, Turiev spotted a small 60-meter-deep trench on the seafloor. The seabed all around was 40 meters, this was where the Finns would set their depth charges to explode. S-12 descended into the trench. The submarine was rocked by exploding depth charges and battered by debris from the seabed. But she suffered no serious damage. After dark, S-12 made her escape, but Turiev had no intention of cutting short his patrol. He made a torpedo attack on the aging German battleship Schlesien, but missed. He was finally forced back to base by autumn storms. On the 17th of October 1942, Commander Leeson took S-7 on a second Baltic patrol. But while recharging batteries on the surface, S-7 was attacked by a Finnish submarine. Four men of the upper watch, including Commander Leeson, were thrown clear. The other 42 crew members perished. It was from inside a Finnish prisoner of war camp that Leeson heard he'd been made a hero of the Soviet Union. When Finland signed an armistice in 1944, Leeson returned to active service. He fought against Japan in 1945 and finally retired from the service in 1970. In 1942, Soviet submarines had struck a small but significant blow against Germany's vital supply line across the Baltic Sea. But it came at a heavy price. In 1942, Soviet submarines sank at least 21 ships and damaged a further nine. But of 27 Baltic Fleet submarines on patrols, 12 did not return. And what was already a dangerous environment for Soviet submarines was about to become a death trap. By the end of 1941, it was clear that Hitler faced a long struggle against the Soviet Union. 
he assigned the German Air Force and Navy the task of stopping Allied aid convoys reaching Russia across the Arctic Ocean. These convoys brought much needed shipments of food, supplies and vehicles to the northern ports of Murmansk and Arkhangelsk. Cargo ships from North America and Britain were assembled into convoys and assigned a naval escort for the dangerous Arctic crossing to northern Russia. The proximity to German-occupied Norway made the protection of warships essential. Convoys bound for the USSR were codenamed PQ and those returning QP. The first Allied convoy of seven merchant ships arrived without loss at Arkhangelsk on the 31st of August 1941. The convoys passed within 200 miles of the Norwegian coast at speeds of no more than 10 knots. Conditions on the crossing could be horrendous. Waves the size of houses, temperatures of minus 30 degrees centigrade, and incessant Arctic gales. Destroyers of the Soviet Northern Fleet joined the escort for the final leg of the journey to Russia and provided defense against German air and submarine attack. The early convoys to Russia consisted of no more than a dozen transport ships, and the first seven convoys suffered no losses at all. The first U-boat attack against an Arctic convoy did not occur until January 1942 and resulted in the loss of one transport from convoy PQ-7A. But as the convoys increased in size, so too did their losses. Convoy PQ-17 set sail in June 1942 with 34 ships, of which 23 were sunk by German aircraft and U-boats. This disaster led to the suspension of Arctic convoys for three months. Hitler, in his determination to choke off any aid to the Soviet Union, sent heavy reinforcements to Norway, including the mighty new battleship Tirpitz. She was a sister ship to the Bismarck and, like her, carried a fearsome battery of eight 15-inch guns. Soviet sub K-21, under Commander Lunin, was also bound for Norway. On the afternoon of the 5th of July, 1942, K-21's sonar officer reported the sound of heavy warships. It was the Tirpitz, leading a German squadron to intercept the Allied convoy PQ-17. Lunin used his periscope to observe the target, although he knew that in clear weather, there was a danger that its wake could be spotted by a German lookout. The German ships were moving at high speed, leaving only a small window for Lunin to make his attack. As Lunin made his approach, the warship suddenly changed course. He had to act quickly. From inside the enemy formation, K-21 attacked with its stern torpedo tubes. Lunin fired four torpedoes, then waited for the sound of explosions. The sonar officer reported two explosions. Lunin radioed the fleet commander, claiming a hit on the Tirpitz. But they were wrong. The torpedoes had missed. Meanwhile, in the Black Sea, 
Soviet submarines were also active in hunting down the enemy. Lookouts on the Sher 205 studied a freighter that carried no national flag. According to an Anglo-Turkish agreement, all Cromor mined in neutral Turkey was to be bought up by Great Britain, thus depriving Germany of its main supply of chrome, which it needed for alloys used in the armaments industry. But Turkey continued to sell chrome ore to Germany as well, in shipments sent to Bulgaria, which Soviet submarines tried to intercept. The Turkish freighter Dua Tepe spotted the submarine and raced for an inlet. Captain Lieutenant Suhemlinov gave the order to open fire with the deck gun. A stream of shells soon reduced the Dua Tepe to a blazing wreck. The submarine's next victim was the Turkish transport, Shafak. Two torpedoes tore the small ship to pieces. The Sher 205's next mission was to deliver ammunition to the besieged naval base of Sebastopol. When the ammunition was unloaded, 50 wounded soldiers were crammed into the small submarine for evacuation. The Sher 205 survived around 40 bomb and depth charge attacks before reaching the safety of Novorossiysk on the Black Sea's eastern shore. The Black Sea was less dangerous for Soviet subs than the narrow straits of the Baltic. But shallow coastal waters posed their own risk. The sea was often no more than 10 to 15 meters deep and could be heavily mined by the Germans. Soviet submarine commanders had to be bold and aggressive. In October 1942, Commander Greshilov, in a small M-class submarine, sank the 500-ton German tanker Le Progress as she sailed under escort near the Danube Delta. In August 1943, Greshilov, now commanding a larger Pike-class submarine, struck again, sinking the Turkish transport Tisby under the noses of her escort of two destroyers and two sub-hunters. She went to the bottom with 1,600 tons of chrome ore aboard her. In 1944, Greshilov was awarded the USSR's highest honor, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. Back in the Baltic, the threat posed by Soviet submarines caused the Germans to take drastic new measures. Minefields alone were clearly not working. In the spring of 1943, the Germans began erecting huge steel nets across the Gulf of Finland. This double anti-submarine net, codenamed Walrus, stretched 25 miles from Nysa Island off the coast of Estonia to the coast of Finland. The net was too strong for even the largest submarine to break through. For good measure, the Germans and Finns laid another 9,000 mines in the Gulf of Finland. On Hogland Island, they built an underwater listening station to detect passing submarines. When the winter ice melted, the first Soviet submarines attempted to break through this formidable array of defenses. In May 1943, Sher 303, under the command of Ivan Travkin, left Kronstadt bound for the Baltic. Two days into the patrol, Sonar reported a rhythmic, metallic rasping against the hull. Travkin made several attempts to get through the net, but all ended in failure.
With sonar also picking up several enemy anti-submarine patrols, Travkin decided to report his findings and head for home. Shir 408 was less lucky. She was detected and sunk by enemy patrol craft. Shir 406, under the command of hero of the Soviet Union, Yevgeny Osipov, also never returned to base. When Trafkin returned, he and his crew were greeted like men back from the dead. The Baltic Fleet Command tried bombing the nets from the air. Submarines tried firing torpedoes at it. But neither had any effect. Two more submarines, the S-9 and S-12, were lost whilst investigating the net. After that, all attempts to break through were suspended. For the time being, the Germans had succeeded in trapping and neutralizing the entire Soviet Baltic fleet. In the Black Sea, it was the German Luftwaffe that posed the greatest threat to the Soviet Navy. In the first weeks of the war, the Soviet Black Sea Fleet conducted raids against Romanian ports and later against the German-occupied Crimea. The first raid, just four days into the war, targeted oil storage facilities at the Romanian port of Costanza. But after a short bombardment, the destroyer Moskva hit a mine and sank rapidly, leading to the withdrawal of the raiding force. Soviet Marines also carried out small-scale raids against Romanian targets. After the fall of the Crimea, the Black Sea Fleet targeted Axis forces stationed on its coastline. In October 1943, three destroyers, Kharkov, Sposotny and Bespeshadny, left the east coast to conduct a nighttime bombardment of German positions at Yalta and Feodosia. Then they sailed for home. At dawn, the destroyers were attacked by eight Stuka dive bombers with fighter escorts. Kharkov was hit in a boiler room and taken in tow by Sposobny. But the German air attack was unrelenting. The last raid consisted of 25 Stukas with a large fighter escort. Soviet fighters arrived, but it was an uneven contest. Anti-aircraft guns and fighters managed to destroy 18 German aircraft. But all three Soviet destroyers were sunk. 780 sailors of the Black Sea Fleet were lost with them. This disaster caused the Stavka to prohibit any further surface raids in the Black Sea. From the conning tower of S-56, men peered anxiously towards the shore. Finally, they saw the signal. The submarine was there to land a reconnaissance team behind enemy lines. It was a frequent mission for Soviet submarines during the war. S-56, under Commander Shedrin, had travelled from Vladivostok more than halfway around the world via the Panama Canal to reach the Arctic Ocean. This 17,000-mile route was the only way to avoid major war zones and the winter ice. Northern Fleet submarines were also tasked with attacking convoys that brought supplies to Axis forces in northern Russia. On the 17th of May 1943, near the northern tip of Norway, 
S-56 sighted a convoy of one tanker, four cargo ships and eight escort vessels. Shedrin fired a salvo of four torpedoes. In one salvo, S-56 had sunk the tanker Eurostat, carrying 1,300 tons of fuel and damaged the steamer Vaterland. The attack was followed by a six-hour chase in which more than 60 depth charges were dropped, but none found their mark. As huge battles raged at Stalingrad and Kursk, in the north, the front remained static, and the battle to defend the Arctic convoys with their vital cargoes of military aid continued. The Soviet Northern Fleet fought a running battle against U-boats and the Luftwaffe into 1944. That year, a major development finally allowed the Soviet Baltic Fleet to break free of its shackles. In September 1944, Finland signed an armistice, allowing Soviet ships to bypass the net and mine defences of the Gulf of Finland, and even operate from Finnish ports. In January 1945, the Red Army launched an offensive into East Prussia. The Germans began a massive operation to evacuate military personnel and equipment by sea. The ships also carried thousands of refugees. Amongst them was the Wilhelm Gustloff, a cruise ship requisitioned by the German Navy. On the 30th of January, she set sail from Gdynia amidst heavy snowfall and temperatures of minus 10. On board were 918 U-boat cadets, 500 other military personnel, and according to some estimates, as many as 9,000 refugees of whom nearly half were children. Fearing a collision with other convoys, the captain of the Wilhelm Gustloff turned on her navigation lights. It was these lights that led Commander Marinesco's S-13 to her shortly after 9 p.m. Marinesco stalked his quarry for more than an hour. Having got into a firing position, he launched four torpedoes. Three hit the liner with devastating consequences. More than 9,000 lives were lost on the Wilhelm Gustloff, but the Soviet Navy defended its right to attack a ship under escort carrying military personnel. Two weeks later, the same submarine sank the liner von Steuben with the loss of 4,000 lives. The majority of them in this case, wounded German soldiers. In the first months of 1945, the Red Army was advancing rapidly, crossing Poland to threaten Berlin in the north and crossing Hungary to reach Vienna in the south. But there were still pockets of German resistance along the Baltic coast in Pomerania and Latvia. Destroying these groups' communications by sea was the Baltic Fleet submarine's last mission of the war. Searchlights swept across the entrance to the Bay of Danzig. For the commander of Soviet submarine L3, it was a discouraging sight. Commander Konovalov had orders to break into the bay, but he considered it a suicidal task. L3 stood off at the bay's entrance. In early 1945, it was the scene of intense air and sea battles, particularly around the Hell Peninsula, as the Germans desperately tried to evacuate the remnants of their military forces and thousands of terrified refugees. But they had to run the gauntlet of Soviet submarines. On the 17th of April, 1945, 
L3 sighted a convoy leaving the bay. It was bound from hell to Svinemunde. After dark, Konovalov attacked with three torpedoes. His victim was the transport ship Goya, carrying more than 6,000 passengers. There were just 183 survivors. In July 1945, Konovalov was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. His crew were also decorated. On the very first day of the war, the submarine L3 had been at the mercy of the German Luftwaffe. It had only been spared because the Germans did not consider Soviet submarines to be a high enough priority. But they had gone on to prove themselves a truly deadly adversary. Today, the conning tower of L3 is on display at the Moscow Museum of the Great Patriotic War. The Soviet people celebrated Victory Day on the 9th of May, 1945. And on the 22nd of July, Soviet ships hoisted their colors to mark the first Navy Day since the end of the war. It was also marked by parades, and on this occasion, an address from Josef Stalin to all Soviet sailors. It read, the Navy has more than fulfilled its duty to the Soviet motherland. <laughs>